ID 24. Uh, in this hour, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Jared Smith, who's uh, joining us uh, from uh, the WebAIM uh, organization, uh, a really brilliant uh, and vibrant uh, place to, to get help and information and, and useful things relating to accessibility on the web. Don't forget, you can track everything on the hashtag ID24 and uh, using Twitter and that hashtag is the best way to uh, pose any questions you've got for Jared. He's going to be talking uh, about colour and uh, the different challenges that it poses and some different ways of, of approaching solutions. So, Jared, over to you. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch over to the slides. Um, as Leone mentioned, please post any questions out to the um, let me make sure I've got the right window here out to uh, Twitter. I'll try to answer those at the end. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, color and contrast and uh, rethinking these a little bit, maybe getting a, a new or different perspective on color and contrast and considering the accessibility implications. Um, and with that, I'm just going to start uh, with this question of what is color? It's really kind of a deep question uh, if you think about it. There's a lot that uh, comes into factor as we consider actually what color is and how we perceive color, the meaning of color, and how it might impact mood and feel and certainly accessibility. To kind of answer that question at least a little bit from maybe a little more technical perspective, uh, color is really a combination of several things. It's the reflection of certain wavelengths of light off of objects. Um, it's our ability um, to physically receive that uh, within our eyes, you know, so we have physical receptors in our eyes that process those various wavelengths. And then it's also our cognitive perception of that uh, data. So our eyes interpret this information, but our, our, our brain you know, receives those signals and does something with it, and that can vary a lot. So it's really hard to know exactly what color is or how we might perceive it differently. You know, the, the age-old question comes up of, do we see color the same way? When I see a red stop sign, do I see it in the same way that other people might see it? And we can't really know that in, in many ways. Uh, from a physiological perspective, within our eyes, on the back of our eye, on our retina, we have rods and cones, different types of receptors, and those rods and cones undergo a chemical change when they absorb light, and that triggers, uh, triggers electrical signals that go to our brain that are then interpreted. So the rods within our eyes generally detect only brightness. Um, so if you're at night and you're you know, that's kind of where our night vision comes from. You don't really see color in low light conditions, but you can perceive contrast or luminance or brightness. Um, <clears throat> the cones of our eyes, they perceive either red, green, or blue. And that's where we get our color vision from and generally more effective during the daylight. The cones of our eyes uh, of our, on our retina are generally in the middle, kind of the center part of our vision and the rods are generally more dispersed uh, kind of on the, on the outside of our retina. At night, as our, as our pupils dilate, we generally have better vision because there's more light that's getting to those rods on the outside. It also explains why we have better um, averted vision, if you're familiar with that. Sometimes at night, if you look away from something, you naturally perceive the light a little bit better. It's because more of that light is hitting the, hitting the rods um, on the edges of our retina. So, but the cones, that's really where the magic happens when it comes to uh, color vision and perceiving um, color. So if the, uh, that, oops, let's see, let's go back here. Sorry, I just killed my slides. There we go. If we, if the, that photo pigment that uh, is within the cones of our eyes, if any of those are insufficient, then we may have color deficiency, difficulty perceiving red, green, or blue, or some combination thereof. Color vision can also be affected uh, by cognitive function. Um, some individuals that have had, say, traumatic brain injury may also have some form of color deficiency or color blindness, difficulty in perceiving 
certain colors, not because their eyes can't perceive those colors, but because their brain may not be interpreting that information correctly. So it's that perception of color that really causes these visceral reactions to things like double rainbows, dude, right? If you've seen that, um, where we can have these really strong reactions to certain colors and colors really have meaning. Now, when it comes to color blindness or color deficiency, red, green color deficiency really is the most common. But there are many other types. Uh, you can't simply uh, categorize this into the use of particular colors that we should avoid because there are so many types of color blindness that if we took that approach, it would kind of mean that we couldn't use color at all. And color blindness primarily is impacted by our eyes, but our brain has a lot to do with it too. Uh, there's the famous case of the dress, right? Which is, it's actually become known as, most of you are probably familiar with this. Um, if you haven't, uh, or even if you are familiar with it, you just take a moment and look at this dress. Some people see this black dress as being black and blue. Others perceive it as being white and gold. And so you might just look at this uh, photo and, and, I, and I will kind of disclaim up front the for uh, those with visual disabilities, I'll try to explain things as they go, but we are talking about color and color perception here. So do you see blue and black or white and gold? Everybody um, tends to see these within one of those uh, two categories, um, but they can perceive this image very, very differently. Um, I happen to see white and gold. And about two thirds of people do see white and gold, but about a third see blue and black uh, for this particular dress. And why is that? It's not a function of our vision, I mean, in our, uh, you know, the perception of color within our eyes, it's all has to do with our brain and what our brain is doing with that information. Um, this is a graphical presentation of, of what that is actually doing inside of our brain. It has to do with what our brain has considered the tint or kind of color overlay of that particular image. Um, on the left, those of you that see black and blue, that's how you perceive it. On the right, uh, gold and white, that's how you perceive it based on the overlaying tint. But the actual colors are identical. And this illusion is peculiar because once you see one color, your brain generally refuses to accept the other. You can't switch like you generally can with many visual illusions. But the colors in this example are actually the same. So, you know, going back to the example, do you see blue or blue and black or white and gold? Again, um, kind of a, even removing that uh, external stimulus of this image, the bars across this image demonstrate that the colors are exactly the same, even though your mind may perceive that in a particular way. But yet our brain tends to view these very, very differently and can even refuse the color that doesn't seem to match with our uh, our mental perception of how that works. Another interesting consideration with this is our categorization of colors themselves. Physically, we can differentiate around 3 million different colors, but we have names for around 20 or 30 of them. And so we tend to categorize colors based on names, and that can impact our, our perception of color as we categorize things into, into particular areas. So I'm very much in camp white and gold in this case. I can never see uh, the, the blue and black. Um, I showed this to my 10-year-old son this morning, and blue is mine because he sees blue and black, and he printed it out, and as we speak, he's running around the neighborhood showing this picture to all of his friends to, to see what color of uh, the dress that they, that they see. So um, to, can, to move on, I want to do a little myth busting and talking about uh, contrast or opposites, think of our, our stars of uh, myth busters themselves. Um, so first statement here, color blindness is relatively common. And this is eh, from a very technical perspective, false. Um, when we use the term color blindness, that's a little bit of a misnomer, probably isn't really accurate. Um, there are some that do not see color at all that are truly color blind. Uh, achromatopsia is what that's called. Generally, you would see the world in shades of gray. How many shades of gray? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put a number to that. That is really quite rare. It affects 0.0025% uh, 
of the population. Now, we'll call it color blindness. We, you know, shouldn't be overly pedantic, um, but really color deficiency is a more accurate term to use um, generally when we're talking about color blindness or color deficiency. Another statement, color deficiency affects around 8% of men and around 0.5% of women. I hear this statistic uh, thrown around a lot. It's uh, one that we actually use, but in reality, it is false. Um, those numbers really are only accurate if you're of North, Northern European or Caucasian uh, descent. Among Asian men, African men, it's much less than 5%. Among uh, Eskimos, it's only 1%. And a lot of that is a factor of uh, genetic um, inheritance of the trait that causes color deficiency. It's an X chromosome uh, mutation, and so is uh, carried and pre uh, present or prevalent uh, in men, although uh, some women can have color deficiency as well. Um, generally, women that have color deficiency, their uh, male children will all be color deficient as well. Uh, color perception is also something that can decrease with age, it's just a function of vision. As we age, we tend to lose visual acuity and very often color perception as well. Another statement, it's a WCAG failure to use color to convey information or meaning. This is also false. <laughs> the true statement is it's a WCAG failure to use color alone to convey information or meaning. And we need to make sure that we make that differ, uh, differentiation. Sometimes we, um, we find ourselves in the accessibility community at odds with design because of this perception that we can't use design or can't use color or we have to be very limited in our usage of color and that's not the case. So as we look at the actual accessibility guidelines, uh, which I 2.0, Success criterion 1.4.1, this is a level A success criterion, deals with the use of color and it reads, color is not used as the only primary, I'm sorry, the only visual means of conveying information, indicating an action, prompting a response, or distinguishing a visual element. Generally, uh, pretty uh, straightforward. Um, this does bring up some interesting questions sometimes in our use of color, particularly uh, particularly in design, we use color a lot to convey stuff. <laughs> but is what we uh, convey with that color, how do we draw the line between um, content and information and just color that's maybe there to convey something else that is maybe less critical? If you take a, a screenshot from our website, for instance, uh, the navigation items at the top right, uh, about once a year I get an email from someone that uh, indicates that these links do not meet the requirements for color reliance because they're not underlined and they don't become underlined on mouse hover and keyboard focus and you know, therefore, you know, WebAIM hates people with disabilities or something like that. And this, we have to remember that uh, color reliance is a visual thing. Visually, if you can perceive that something has functionality or the 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 content of that, um, with without the color, then that is sufficient. Um, you know, visually, you can tell that these items on our website are links, and that's sufficient even if it does not fully meet the contrast requirements. This generally uh, applies to things like links within body text, where if those links are not underlined and you're relying on color alone, then those links are reliant on color, and if that color is lost or not perceived, then the links do not become perceivable. So we need to be careful that we don't uh, extend this too much. <laughs> Sometimes we can have adverse impact on design by thinking that an accessibility requirement applies in places where it probably does not, or at least doesn't really have an impact on actual accessibility. Where this is more prevalent are things like um, indicating required fields uh, marked in the color red. Um, you know, that reliance on color alone, even for instance, uh, borders of text inputs to indicate invalid or required fields is a pure case of relying on color alone to convey information or meaning. Now you can use the color, you just don't want to rely on the color alone to convey that information or meaning. So in this case, an additional text information, perhaps an icon um, 
or some other visual indicator beyond color alone would be sufficient to indicate uh, these required fields. WCAG does delim delineate additional requirements for non-underlying links. Again, if you have links within body text that are not underlined by default, they are therefore relying on color alone to indicate that they're links. If that color information is lost or not perceived, the links will not be uh, differentiated. So the guidelines require a, a three to one contrast ratio between the linked text and the non-linked text. That poses some interesting constraints, uh, if that's the right word to design, just meaning that we now have three contrast requirements. We have the three to one contrast ratio between the linked text and the non-linked text, and then we also have the contrast requirements between the linked text and the background and the non-linked text and the background. That leaves a fairly narrow window of available colors uh, or contrasts that we can use in order to meet these requirements. Uh, the guidelines also require that the link present what WCAG calls a non-color designator. Typically, that's the introduction of the underline on both mouse hover and on keyboard focus. Um, this would allow a user, for instance, that overrides your page colors. Uh, maybe I have low vision and I see yellow text on a blue background. That's the color combination that I see best. If I override your page colors, then your non-underlined links disappear. This provides a mechanism that the user can scan, can move their mouse or navigate with the keyboard to discover those links. This certainly is not optimal. <laughs> that uh, introduces a pretty significant burden to that user. Um, so you'd want to consider that. Non-underlined links went out of style, I think, for a while, but I think they're coming back in style primarily with mobile. So you consider a small screen environment very often in a native low contrast environment, say out in the sun with the you know, glare on the screen, identifying links via underline is a pretty good indicator that those things are actionable. So if you want to avoid all of this extra work, uh, these two additional requirements, simply underline your links and that will be sufficient. So a couple of examples of this, this uh, are some examples uh, we pulled from uh, the PayPal website some time ago. They've allowed us to use these. Um, these are some uh, links that are reliant on color alone. In this case, there actually was no possible color that could have been utilized to meet that three to one contrast ratio while also maintaining the 4.5 to one contrast ratio between these two colors and the background. So it was an interesting dilemma where the only way to address this was to either underline the links or to significantly change the colors because it's not, uh, it's kind of a darker gray text. Um, one way to easily perceive both contrast and color reliance issues is to desaturate the page. Uh, with this example desaturated, meaning the color information has been removed, the links pretty much disappear. It's uh, pr pretty much visually impossible to d differentiate which things are links and which are not. The approach that was implemented in this case was actually to bold the links. They actually changed the colors a little bit. They made it a little darker blue, provided a little more uh, contrast in color between the link text and the non-link text, but also to bold the links. Now, they chose not to do underline uh, for design reasons. In this case, if you desaturate the page, the links are still perceivable. Now, certainly not as perceivable as if they had been underlined. <laughs> the underline is a very, very visually distinctive indicator of links, but this sufficed. It provided that visual differentiation even if color was lost. Now, this also brings up some interesting questions about link states, hover state, uh, when you hover your mouse over it, uh, focus state when you tab to it, active and visited uh, link states. <clears throat> WCAG does not specifically define if or how the contrast uh, or color reliance um, uh, things apply to those, I think certainly they do. One strong recommendation I would have is for hover states of links and focus states of links or buttons, ensure that they have sufficient contrast. Very often on hover, we make a we change the color slightly of our links. If you're going to change that on hover or on focus, move it to a higher contrast state rather than a lower contrast state. When hovering or focusing a link, it indicates that you're currently interacting with it. The likelihood that you're reading that text is really, really high at that point. So ensure in that state it has a higher contrast state. <clears throat>
So a few considerations for color reliance. One, um, beyond impacting some users with certain types of color deficiency based on the color combination, if you're blind, you're also colorblind. That sounds quite obvious when <laughs> you say it, but a screen reader does not generally identify the color of information within a page. This will also impact users who override page colors or enable high contrast modes. If they change your colors, your color information is lost. If you're relying on color to convey information or meaning, that can be lost. So this is a pretty big population of users that can be impacted by relying on color alone. As we move on uh, more to contrast, uh, WCAG also has a requirement for contrast at level AA, which is of note, there is no single A contrast requirement. White text on a white background, I guess, is inaccessible to everyone, but there is no single A requirement uh, for contrast. Um, so it requires and really only applies to text and images of text. It does not apply to other interface components. We'll come back to those a little bit later and requires a 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio with the exception of large text. If it's big and bold or really big, it requires a lower contrast level at 3 to 1. If it's incidental text, which would be disabled controls or things that are purely decoration, things that are invisible to everyone, or things that are part of a busy picture where the content really isn't important or relevant, those have no contrast requirement, and logos are also exempted. Uh, disabled controls is kind of an interesting one because very often we convey critical information or functionality via disabled controls. Um, for instance, this button is disabled and the disabled state is indicating that there is a form validation message, yet to indicate a disabled control, we present it with low contrast. So that critical information is exempted from WCAG, but is pretty important. So we would maybe want to rethink how we are using disabled controls, especially in uh, their low contrast presentation. WCAG also defines large text using points, uh, which is uh, a size measurement that is pretty much irrelevant to the web today, defines it uh, large text as being 14 point or larger in bold 14 point, converts to about 18.66 pixels or 18 point and larger, and 18 point converts to 24 pixels. Uh, we recently conducted a little uh, test of uh, many of the popular website homepages on the web, the top 100 US uh, website homepages. We found 91 of the 100 pages had detectable, meaning automatically detectable, um, AA contrast failures. And on average, those homepages, they average 70 contrast errors. So. I think that's pretty notable. 91% <laughs> of the most popular home pages on the web have contrast failures and on average 70 contrast errors each. That's, I think this is pretty significant. Um, Wave does do pretty smart calculation of contrast. It considers you know, CSS inheritance and things like that. It does not consider background images. Um, which is not a flaw or a deficiency, I think, in Wave. Um, if you consider that some users disable background images, if you have text that overlays an image and that image is disabled or does not load for some reason, if there's not a background color that has been defined that provides sufficient contrast, that text will be presented in low contrast or may disappear altogether. So um, essentially the takeaway there is if you have defined background images that have text on top of them, ensure that you've defined a background color as well. That background color will serve as a fallback in case the image does not load for some reason. At WebAIM, we've also conducted surveys of users with disabilities. We did a, a survey of users with low vision. We asked them how important uh, adequate color contrast is for them. 67% indicated very important, 24% indicated somewhat important. So the fact that you know 91% of respondents find contrast to be important uh, is, is pretty significant. They also cited poor contrast as the third most problematic issue that they encounter on the web. So if you think about all of the accessibility issues that someone with low vision might run into, low contrast was uh, very high up the list. So if you want to figure out where you're at when it comes to um, WCAG uh, compliance and contrast, all you need to do is run this simple formula, <laughs> and it's really pretty complicated, but it has to be. Um, you know, determining the contrast levels uh, or ratio between two, two colors re 
involves a fair amount of math. It can be a little bit of, of uh, complicated. You want to use tools to do this. There are many tools out there. WebAIM has a contrast checking tool. Wave will test it. And there is a myriad of others that are out there with various features to help you um, determine where you're at um, when it comes to what you add and what that contrast ratio is. It does all of this nasty math for you. But really what this measures is luminance contrast. And there's more to contrast than just luminance or the brightness of uh, the of colors, the dif difference in the luminance or brightness between, say, foreground and background. Johannes Itten um, has a, a really good write-up on this. It's called The Art of Color and it, uh, the Subjective Experience and Objective Rationale of Color. And he identifies seven, seven different color contrasts. I'm going to go through these seven in order just to highlight that there's more to contrast than simply luminance, or the thing that WCAG primarily measures. Uh, the first um, it in color contrast is light, dark, or luminance contrast. That's the thing that WCAG primarily focuses on, although it does account a little bit for hues or, or colors. Um, so this is really the difference in brightness or luminance, and also is impacted by tone values, the actual colors that that you use. So this is primarily what we think of, especially in accessibility, this is primarily what we look at is luminance uh, contrast. He also defines contrast of hue, and that's the just, just, uh, juxtaposition of different hues. So as we put colors together, there's a color contrast, not luminance contrast, but the difference in colors themselves uh, impact a difference in perception or contrast itself. There's a uh, cold warm contrast, meaning that we perceive or have different moods or fills with different types of colors, whether they're considered a warm color, kind of reds or oranges, pink, or a cool color, greens and blues. We, as we put those together or in juxtaposition, they are contrasted. We have different moods or fills or perception of those colors based on their, uh, whether they're warm or cold. There's also complementary contrast. That means how well colors go together. As we consider a color wheel, colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel are considered complementary and they generally go together, purple and yellow, red and green. Um, and those adjacent complementary colors provide increased contrast. Other combinations tend to clash, not so much because they have poor luminance contrast, but because they just don't seem to go together very well, and that is a contrast. There's also simultaneous contrast. This is an, uh, an interesting example, and it works best if you have this at full screen, um, but the two colors of gray within these two boxes are the same color, but I want you to look at the one in the left box, in the yellow box, and just look at it for a few minutes, uh, or a minute here. Just kind of stare at that color of gray. What simultaneous contrast means is that adjacent colors can cause us to perceive the opposite or complementary color in places where it is absent. So as you can continue to look at this gray box in the left hand, um, uh, on the left hand side, it will eventually, for most people, not everyone, but it will eventually begin to get a little bit of a purple tint to it. Um, especially is with kind of your averted vision as you compare it to the gray box on the right, which will over time begin to develop a little bit of a light gray tint. And as the longer you look at this, the more different, for most people, not everyone, but the more different those two gray boxes begin to appear. The one on the left tends to look darker than the one on the right. And this poses an interesting question because they're exactly the same color. But the fact, uh, the simultaneous usage of colors around them causes us to perceive them differently. So how do we start to measure these types of things, especially with a math formula when the context of colors can change our perception of them? It's an interesting aspect of contrast that's uh, not encapsulated or measured by WCAG, yet can really have an impact on our perception. It can also define contrast of saturation, just meaning that the same color can have varying levels of contrast based on how saturated it is. So this is very much related to luminance or brightness, but yellow tends to be, you know, pretty distinct or visually bright compared to blue, even though the saturation levels may be the same. 
There's also contrast of extension or quantity or proportion, meaning that as we, uh, the predominant colors, you know, this little tiny blue box in a very large yellow box um, gives us a different um, level of opposition or contrast compared to two boxes that would be the same size. So this, there are seven additional aspects of contrast, six of which really are not measured by WCAG, but all of which have an impact on our perception of contrast and colors. So how do we start to measure all of this, especially with automated tools? Well, you really can't. Um, it becomes really difficult to do in an automated way. But I think as accessibility implementers, as um, uh, people that are thinking about this, we need to consider that there's more to contrast than simply luminance, which brings us to the point that common sense is vital when considering color contrast. So I have various colors, uh, words in various colors here on the screen. Many of you have probably seen this. If you've seen some of my presentations, I've probably shown this to over 10,000 people before in various presentations. Some of these words meet the WCAG contrast requirements and some of them do not. So simply looking at this, which of these seem to be most visually distinctive to you? Uh, some tend to maybe jump out or be more readable, others maybe uh, less so. So if you could just pick which of these you think um, are most visually distinctive. Um, almost universally when I show this presentation, people tend to volunteer that the word contrast at the bottom, the bright red color, is most visually distinctive. But if we look at how WCAG defines these, the top four all pass, the bottom four all fell. Which brings up some interesting questions as to whether WCAG really best aligns to human perception. It provides a measure of contrast, but it does, but does it mm, always align to human perception? It's an interesting question. Uh, the middle two colors, uh, one is slightly darker than the other, um, and that's the way that WCAG works. It draws a line in the sand. Um, it defines a threshold. Anything this side, you pass. Yay! Anything on this side, you fail. Boo! But that's not how human perception works. It's not like, uh, not like someone with low vision would uh, look at these two words and see the top one perfectly fine, but fail to even perceive the bottom one. It simply doesn't work that way. The human experience is much more dynamic, yet accessibility guidelines define pass or fail. Common sense, I think, is necessary. We need to consider more the user experience than perhaps simply uh, pass or fail. Um, I've also found with this example that people that are more versed in accessibility tend to reject the red and green words at the bottom. They tend to say that they fail much more than people that are not versed in accessibility, which is an interesting case. Uh, you know, I think it just indicates that people that understand how the WCAG formula works tend to maybe uh, discriminate a little bit more against reds and greens uh, because they are discriminated against in the contrast formula and, and threshold. Um, so I think our context and, and the foundation that we have changes our perception of colors, changes our ability to perceive contrast based on our experience and even our knowledge. Um, now, the WCAG 2.0 contrast ratio and uh, the formula and the ratios that are defined for pass and fill are based on research from the 1990s. The actual primary research that's cited in WCAG 2.0 was conducted in the year 2000 on an Amiga 1000 computer. This is a photo of an Amiga 1000 monitor. Consider the computer you were looking at in the year 2000 compared to today. Um, modern displays have higher resolution, which has a very big impact on legibility, particularly of text, where the edges of text are much more defined, much clearer, as opposed to this pixelated or jagged edge that impacts contrast. They have higher built-in contrast, and they have better color presentation. Um, they have, you know, reds or truer reds. Um, I guess if you could define what true red is, but they they have a wider gamut of colors that can be presented today than they did in the year 2000. So it just brings up some interesting questions as to you know what what this might actually mean when it comes to accessibility. So just like our our red and uh, I'm sorry our blue and black or uh, gold and white dress um, again our con the context in which we see things changes our perception and has human perception of modern 
video displays changed our perception of colors and contrast? I don't know. Uh, I think the anecdotal evidence would suggest that, that maybe it has, but we need more research on this. So I'm going to go through a, a few other examples here and some considerations with WCAG 2.0. Um, one consideration is that WCAG um, does not address font weight. The one on the left is the exact same font face as the one on the right, but a much heavier weight or boldness. But the one on the left has significantly higher perceived contrast because it's bold as opposed to a very thin font weight. That's something that's not accounted for in WCAG. It also doesn't account for text size. So very small text versus large text. Now, WCAG does have the two thresholds for, for large text, but it doesn't really consider contrast within those two major categories of normal text versus, well, I should say large text versus non-large text. It also does not consider uh, resolution, display resolution, meaning the pixelization of the edges of text. Um, sans serif fonts with the straight lines tend to have less pixelization on lower resolution displays than serif fonts with the hooks and flags where the pixels kind of have to fill in a little bit on those little hooks and flags. So it's another consideration that the WCAG doesn't really uh, have built into its formula. And this isn't to say that's a weakness of WCAG, it's just something we need to be aware of. WCAG doesn't account for uh, text outlines. How would you measure the contrast of something like this has very, you know, white on white is certainly no contrast, but with the outline it provides some contrast, but is it sufficient? It doesn't account for drop shadows. Uh, each of these colors would be below the WCAG contrast thresholds, but with the um, drop shadow, it increases the perceived contrast, but how exactly would we measure that? Again, it's, it becomes a little bit tricky. It doesn't define things like background images um, that may be very busy. Where do we measure the contrast of these types of, of texts? Um, even with drop shadows that increase the perceived contrast, becomes a little bit tricky as to um, you know how, how, from a very technical perspective, how we might measure these types of themes. Um, does not consider gradients. Um, Exactly, you know, how we measure these types of things uh, can be a little bit tricky. The gradient in this case is exactly the same. It just one goes from top to bottom, one goes from bottom to top. Um, generally, most people would probably indicate that the one on the right is more visually uh, distinctive or readable, but that's primarily because the gradient um, favors the majority of the text that's at the bottom. <laughs> so kind of an interesting interesting thought there. It doesn't, uh, you know, WCAG also doesn't really consider transparency and how that might impact, especially when we have um, variances in our text and background with transparency. If we have very stark white on black or black on white, um, this can also cause some interesting um, considerations. So as we look at these, um, both are quite visually distinctive. Um, I'd like to maybe think of which of these would maybe be more visually perceptive or readable to you. Now the contrast ratios for each of these is 21 to 1. Um, however, very stark white on black or black on white can impact readability because of the its Almost, it's the highest level of contrast possible. This can be particularly problematic for users with dyslexia, where because of that stark contrast, the edges of text sometimes become a little bit blurry, or we might get little shadows as we look at that really stark uh, contrast text, and can cause a little difficulty in, in readability. Um, consider these colors of gray, one on white, one on black. Again, just take your guess as to which one, uh, you know, whether the one on the left or the one on the right seems to be most visually distinctive to you. Uh, my informal testing has generally shown that the one on the left is, uh, is preferred, it tends to be more visually distinctive, yet it has a lower contrast ratio. That color of gray on white fills the WCAG 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio. Um, the one, the gray on black is higher, has higher contrast and, and passes, uh, is above the 4.5 to 1. 
A similar situation occurs with uh, red, which is particularly mm, discriminated against, if that's the right word, in the WCAG contrast formula. So red on black versus red on white, um, we can perceive these quite differently. Generally, um, in my informal testing, um, has shown that the one on the right, people tend to indicate as being more visually distinctive, uh, meaning the, the red on white, um, but red on white has a much lower contrast ratio than the same color of red on black, according to the formula. Yet human perception often would suggest something otherwise. Here's another example. This one deals um, more with the actual colors that are used. Again, just kind of eyeballing this, which seems most visually distinctive or do you think would have higher levels of contrast? Most users would generally indicate the one on the right, yet the contrast ratio is exactly the same when it comes to what at. Both of these are 4.5 to 1. This is uh, an example of the contrast of hues, uh, is we use colors or hues that are very similar while their luminance contrast may be high, our perceived contrast is lower because there's not a difference in the actual color hues that are used that they're being used. So it's an, another interesting case. Again, um, simply looking at luminance contrast, um, these both measure the same, but for perception, uh, for many users, it might be different. Um, another case here of blue on yellow text versus yellow on red text. Um, as far as perception and readability, the examples here might be a little bit different. Uh, generally, many people, when they view the one on the right with yellow on red, sometimes they find it very difficult to read because it's very stark. Sometimes they'll actually see like halos or shadows or like mo moving or jumping text because of that very stark or distinct uh, uh, difference. Yet, um, it has a sufficient contrast ratio, as opposed to, in this case, the blue on yellow um, has a very low contrast ratio of 2.79 to 1. Yet, interestingly, blue on yellow or yellow on blue very often are the default colors that are used in screen magnification software because they've found that they have very high levels of readability. Um, they just are complementary and they go together very well. So it's, again, that's an, that's an impact of complementary contrast where colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel tend to have a higher level of perceived contrast. Um, something like this, another example, um, gray text on white versus yellow text on gray. Um, if we simply look at luminance contrast, the one on the right has a much higher level of contrast as opposed to the one on the left. In fact, the yellow on gray has 5.1 to 1, and the gray on white has 3.3 to 1. Um, the Kind of the point here is that while one has much higher contrast, the use of the colors is kind of distinct. We probably wouldn't put yellow text on a dark gray background for the body text on our webpage, even though it has enough contrast. Um, just because of the actual colors that are used, sometimes some just work and some don't. It's very atypical and maybe a bit stark in its uh, color or hue contrast, and that may be problematic. Uh, red and green, um, juxtaposed. Uh, you know, very often accessibility, people would look at this and say, oh man, that's horrible. What about someone that's red, green, colorblind? Well, in this case, the contrast ratio is 4.5 to 1. It is sufficient. Um, when we consider color deficiency, it is not the colors that are used that is the issue. The issue is the contrast. In this case, with 4.5 to 1, even if someone were red, green, color deficient, they may not see red and green in this case, but because of the adequate contrast, they would still be able to adequately read the, the uh, text. So again, this comes back to common sense. There's so much more to contrast and colors than simply luminance contrast and ratios and thresholds. We have to implement uh, common sense when we consider all of this. But there are some other interesting considerations here. One is color blindness. You know, generally, you know, as I've shown this to 10,000 people, 
the vast majority say that the word red, uh, the, the red word contrast at the bottom is most visually distinctive. Would, be, would that be the same for users with color blindness or color deficiency? What about users with low vision that are magnifying content or maybe overriding page colors? There are some in other interesting considerations that we need to think about beyond just our own perception of colors and contrast. These are some areas where WebAIM wants to do some research. We want to look into this some more. Um, to see what actual human perception is with modern web displays of certain colors and font weights and uh, color combinations and contrasts and screen resolutions and screen mag magnification while also considering low vision and uh, color uh, deficiency in, in users. So when we think of color contrast, there's a lot of uh, impacts there. One of the most common ones that I'm seeing now are um, uh, our placeholder texts. Um, this is a poses some interesting questions. Certainly, this example where it's fully reliant on placeholder text to indicate the functionality of these form fields, I would definitely consider this a WCAG failure. But it does bring up some cases of what if we use placeholder text to help reinforce the functionality of a field or to provide hints or cues, but we also provide form validation and error messaging that would provide that information in another way. Um, while placeholder text generally does not meet the WCAG requirements, is that acceptable if there's another mechanism for providing that information? Certainly it has an end user impact, but is it a strict WCAG failure? I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting, interesting question. You know, the WebAIM site, we use placeholder text in our, our search field, but the visual design also indicates that it's a search field. We don't have visible label text for that field, yet visually it's clear what that field is, even in the absence of that placeholder text. So is the low contrast placeholder text a WCAG failure? I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough question, but it's some of the things that we need to consider for accessibility. Um, I just want to highlight quickly uh, in WCAG 2.1, which is currently in a, a very rough draft form, they have introduced at level double, AA a contrast requirement for graphics. This is very welcome, especially with the increased usage of icons and graphics to indicate content and functionality, a gear icon, a checkbox icon, uh, things like that to indicate information or meaning. Um, Previously, uh, you know, WCAG 2.0 only requires sufficient contrast for text and images of text. This would extend that to also apply to graphical components, would require the 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio, with some exceptions. If the lines of that graphic are thick, meaning they're more than 3 pixels, then it would require a lower contrast ratio of 3 to 1. Um, if it's not intended to you know, to convey in anything important. It doesn't have to have a, 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 you know, that contrast. Logos are exempted. Or also if that exact presentation in, you know, maybe it's below low contrast, but that exact, um, you know, graphical presentation is critical, then it would also be exempted. So this is going to be a, a great addition. There's been some discussion of changing the threshold for this. Um, I don't know, but it, it's, it's certainly very welcome and needed for us to ensure sufficient contrast for graphical elements. Um, as before, this uses the same contrast ratio as WCAG 2.0, the same thresholds. It doesn't define how we measure things like background gradients, transparency, background images, drop shadows, outlines, et cetera, et cetera. So it still has some of the same, and again, I don't want to call these weaknesses or deficiencies, but they, it doesn't it doesn't consider a lot of the things that we know impact perception of contrast. So as we rethink a little bit uh, our usage of color and contrast, just know that color accessibility is more than meets the eye. <laughs> see, you know, see what I did there? There's a lot more to this than uh, especially what is defined with accessibility requirements. Do we need to go back and revisit the WCAG contrast formula and thresholds? I think research is needed. I think we should be asking these questions. This is a multi-billion dollar question. Our requirements for contrast in WCAG are significantly impacting designs and usability on the web, on millions of websites. And we know that color matters on the web. So this is a really, really big, important question. And it's one that we're going to 
try to help answer a little bit better. So back to our address, we need to be careful of uh, that we don't only have one perspective on color and use some common sense. And with that, um, I'll say thanks. And it uh, looks like we're pretty much at time, but if there are some questions, I'll turn it over to our hosts and see if there are questions, but thank you. Hi, thank you very much, uh, Jared. That was great. Um, we do have some questions, but I think we are out of time, unfortunately. Uh, so if, if it's okay with you, I will um, send you the, the links to them on Twitter. And would you be able to answer them? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yep. <laughs> great. Okay. Excellent. Well, um, in 10 minutes time, we've got uh, Jessie Beach from uh, Facebook. She's going to be talking about scaling accessibility improvements with tools and process at Facebook. Um, so please join us at the top of the hour. Thank you very much. Thanks again. See you in a bit. Thank you.